everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. Deborah Dubris has had many bumps in the road, personally, professionally, and health-wise, but none of them stopped this one-time receptionist from becoming the owner and CEO of a $20 million a year construction company. Her current company, ClearEdge, focuses on creating personal and professional excellence. Using a combination of neuroscience, social-emotional intelligence, positive psychology, neural gamification, and more, Deborah talks about how average is an addiction and how you can beat it. Deborah, welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, um, tell us a little bit of your story. Thank you, Pat. I am so appreciative of being a guest of yours today. So the uh, short synopsis is I was born and raised in a small town outside of Chicago, about 8,800 people named Blackport, Illinois, which is right next to Joliet, Illinois, which is best known for Stateville Prison, Blues Brothers and all of that. Um, in When I was... Uh, in 18 months, I'll say it this way, in 18 months, I graduated high school, cosmetology school, um, went to Chicago, took my state boards, um, got my license. So I was, we were called, you know, beauticians back then. We weren't stylists, we were beauticians. Um, also, I think I said graduated high school, um, got married and had my first child. And that happened within 18 months and it all completed a month before I turned 19 years old. So I thought I knew everything. I was just so damn smart until I went into labor. And then it's like, I could use some help here. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it, a few years later, we had, uh, well, six years later, we had uh, our son, my former husband and I, and we moved out to Arizona. I'm in the Scottsdale area, Phoenix, Scottsdale area of Arizona. And uh, after you know getting my daughter settled, my husband was uh, you know, had a position that he was going into. Um, I decided that it, my entire goal was to get out of the house, not talk baby talk, and earn enough money to put my youngest into a really good preschool that was more than cut and paste. Uh, so I ended up, I found a, a position which I was thrilled with as a receptionist for a property management development company. The only problem was six months later, I was bored to tears. Um, I had rearranged everything in the front office. Uh, was taking phone calls I wasn't supposed to take, but I knew I could. I knew I could handle it. Um, and a position opened up for our, uh, our sister company, which was right across the hallway in the office building we were in. And it was our construction division uh, because as a uh, property management development company, we would purchase property, put together partnerships on the property, turn it over to our construction division, which would build multi-housing or apartment complexes both all over Arizona and uh, New Mexico. And then we turn it back over to the other company, to the property management uh, side of the company. So they, uh, the, the two women that worked in the construction division kept coming across the hall over to my desk and they'd lean over this little short, this called a pony wall, this little short wall that goes like up to your chest. And they'd lean over and kind of go, come over to the dark side, you know, come over with us. <laughs> And one of the one of the women, uh, she was leaving because she was having her first child. And the position was for construction accountant. Now I had two problems. One, I knew nothing about construction, and two, I had never taken an accounting class in my life. But I wanted the position. Um, one of the things I wanted was a business card because <laughs> back then everybody who came into the you know the front office to meet with somebody handed me a business card, and I just thought that would make me feel so important if I could have one of those with my name on it. But obviously this, the increased salary and position and all that was important as well. So um, I ended up, I'll shorten up the story a little bit. There's a lot more to it, but I ended up uh, applying for the position, went through a lot of angst trying to put together my resume because it, or you know, my resume of the application because I didn't have a background for this. And I saw the applications coming in from CPAs and bookkeepers and people with long, 
you know, long lives in the world of construction. Um, but it was like, what the heck, you know, was interviewed, got the job. And that started a 25 year career in construction where I went literally from answering phones as a receptionist to owning and running a $20 million commercial construction company, which I sold about 16, 17 years ago. And, um, and now have, you know, I started Clear Edge, which is the name of my company, um, where I work with uh, high performance business leaders, CEOs, C-suite uh, and their teams, as well as with uh, athletes, uh, pro athletes and NFL, MLB, you know, baseball, as well as uh, golfers. So that's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Take a breath. <gasps> a lot of things happening in my life in between, but that's the... Uh, career side of things. Um, one of the things I, I want to talk about today is your book, Average is an Addiction. It is just a terrific book. How did that come to be? Well, it was interesting because this was, um, oh, a time in my life when everybody was saying, oh, you've got to have a book. You've got to have a book. Um, so I was part of a group that uh, we hired some people to help us with a book. One of those people happened to be uh, a gentleman who is a six or seven times best-selling author on, you know, the New York lists, not the ones that you buy on Amazon. Um, and I had put together my book and went over to show it to him. And the first thing that he had asked me when I was starting to write it, he said, um, what really, excuse my language, but what really pisses you off? Um, and I said, people performing average when they're so much better than that. They're capable of so much more and they want so much more. Um, and it's a part of me that I don't like at times as well. If I find myself performing average, not that we are average, but we are holding ourselves back in areas and behaving and thinking average. Um, so that's how I ended up um, writing the book. The title was not, I don't remember even what the title of the book was, but when I went over and met with him and had it laid out in a notebook and he was going through it and asking me different questions. And he got to the section that I had titled Averages and Addiction. And he just stopped and looked at me and he said, this is it. And I said, I, I have no idea even what you're looking at. And he said, Averages and Addiction, that's the title. So it became Averages and Addiction from Mediocre to Millions, which is you know, the synopsis of my life <laughs> or encapsulating title of my life. Why do you think people settle? Why? Because we're human. Um, it really boils down to our brain is made in a way to keep us safe. So it's always our eyes are always scanning our eyes or ears. All of our senses are always scanning to see if there's danger in some way, whatever we might deem as danger. Uh, because that's different for each one of us. And because of that, uh, it tends to want to keep us safe. And for our our brain, safe is running our default patterns, doing what we've always done in the way we've always done it, because it compares whatever we're thinking about or desiring. And it goes back into those, that little library of our brain and go, mm-mm don't see anything like that in here. So I don't think that's, Ooh, that's scary. Don't, don't do that. And your, our heart, the emotional side of us is going, but I want it. <laughs> I want to grow. I want to be bigger. I want to be better. How do you move from that status quo into that realm of excellence? By taking, um, it's really by taking small steps but the problem that people typically have is they'll take a small step and whether it works or not, um, they may or may not take the next step because the next step is scary again. Um, and they don't take the time to actually notice that they've taken the step, that they've had the courage to take the step and look at the evidence that they've built for themselves, that they have been able to take a step in order to stand on that evidence as a new level of foundation to go again, to go again to that next step, that next level. Um, me, I tend to take leaps. Um, 
I take leaps and then I do some small steps at the leap and then I'll take another leap and then work the small steps at that point. But it's really just, you know, starting to work with our brain, our mental, emotional, physiological self to build that evidence so that we can continue to move forward and grow in some way. You know, you have the seven C's of excellence um, and one of them is choice. Mm-hmm. Simply choose excellence. Yes. How do you define that? I think it's different for everyone, and it's different in, you know, if we look at an overall category and say, I'm going to be excellent, that's way too big. It's like, I know everybody. Well, no, you don't. You know, have you met, you know, a Rosie over in New Zealand, one of my clients? Probably not. So you don't know everybody. And the brain has a hard time getting getting around, um, uh, I am excellent. But if you look at it and say, I choose, it's my choice to be excellent in something, whatever that something is. Um, whenever I uh, did a great white shark dive, I made a choice that I was going to be as excellent. Now, not an excellent diver, not as good as, you know, all the other divers out there. But for me, I wanted to be in a, and I chose to be in a state of excellence going into that three-day dive, you know, cage diving again, not stupid, but (laughs) totally, but (laughs) in a cage with great white sharks around me. But that was a choice that I made. So you know, it's I interesting, think, though, behind that choice was a lot of work. You had to get certified in scuba. You had to decide to do it. That's absolutely right. And that goes back to the choice. Once I made the choice, typically the choice, it can be a little cumbersome coming up with what is my choice. But making the choice is the easy part. The hard part is when you get to courage. Uh, because typically clients, when they come to me, even NFL players and, and C-suite and all that, oftentimes out here, I want to be confident, you know, I go in what, you know, again, that's a big thing. I want to be confident because you're probably already confident in something. Um, And then they'll say, well, I want to be confident when I go into a boardroom or when I'm out on the field, uh, you know, playing or whatever it might be. And I said, well, it's really not confidence that you're looking for because confidence is an end result. What you're really looking for is making the choice to have courage to do the actions, have the behaviors, and to develop the thoughts that it takes to feel competent in whatever their area is. Yeah, I think having the courage to take on new things is essential and not always easy. But the more you do it, I think it becomes a habit. It is. It's exactly. uh, Because I talk about default behaviors. It's those things that we do over and over and over again without even thinking about it. It's just what we do. It's just like, you know, when you first learn to tie your shoes, you know, it's like right over left, left over right, you know, just give me a pair of slip-ons because this is way too hard uh, until you learn to do it. And then your brain has built an automatic pattern of how to do it. So now you can tie your shoes, be texting to somebody, talking to somebody else, being aware of what's going on in the room, interrupting somebody else's conversation to make a smart remark or whatever it might be. Well, it's the same thing with building a pattern for taking courageous action is, again, when we have stop and have the insight to then also praise ourselves for taking the action, no matter what the results, we're now building evidence for ourselves, if we become aware of it and stay aware of it, that we can do it, whatever it is for each one of us. So it's continuing to build those ev- that evidence so it starts to become automatic pattern that when fear comes up, because every time we take a courageous action, fear is going to be there. They, they, are, they, they work hand in hand with each other. But when the fear comes up and you can look at it as, oh, man, all right, all right, this is an opportunity for growth. I get this. So the question to myself is, is this an area of growth where I want to put my effort and my talents? And if the answer is yes, then the fear subsides a bit and it starts to turn into excitement because you've built evidence that, again, you can do it. So it starts a new default pattern that moves into this um, area of taking action. 
And I think fear can start to become curiosity. It can be. I mean, action trumps fear. Anytime we take action, fear starts to dissipate uh, because the brain now becomes focused on the action more than it's focused on the fear. And the emotional body starts to fall in line with all of that. And uh, you're right. Curiosity can be very helpful because as we become curious, we gain more and more knowledge and the knowledge can help the brain to calm down a bit, just chill out a little bit. Um, so that we can take that courageous action. You know, I look at a formula that I built that it's, um, um, you know, when when we look at knowledge, knowledge nowadays, especially you can Google knowledge. Knowledge is just good table talk. You know, that's about all it's worth. Um, but knowledge, when you now put experience with it because you've gone out and you've taken action now you really have something to work with because now you know what it's like just like you can go on youtube and uh, if you've never ridden a, a bicycle before you can go on youtube and study it and you know have all the knowledge of how to ride a bicycle but then you go on to you go out to get on it it's like oh man nobody told me that you know i was going to fall 14 times before i could pedal you know three feet uh, so that becomes uh, the knowledge plus experience. Now, the part that people miss most often is that next step, which is insight. So now it's having the insight to look at the knowledge and the experience and to say, you know, where is their value in this for me? And the value could be I'm not ever doing that again. Or the value could be, you know, this this is something I can build on. It sparked other thoughts and ideas. And I look to continue to do this and to um, make a choice to have excellence in this area. And now it equals the wisdom for growth. So knowledge plus experience plus insight equals the wisdom for growth. Well, that also goes to consciousness, doesn't it? Consciousness is part of it. I mean, the first step is... um, you know, always looking at that awareness and the first awareness we, it's important to have, and many of us don't in a deep level, is the awareness of ourselves. What are the triggers that we have, both good and bad? Triggers are not bad. Triggers are just signals that something's up. (laughs) And a trigger could be you know, uh, watch a commercial and there's something just wonderful on, on the commercial. And, you know, we've got tears that are forming. It's like, oh, I want to see my family again. Um, or it could trigger something where you're like, oh, crap, I am out of here. I don't want to be around this commercial or TV show or whatever else because it just it's lighting me up inside in a way that does not feel good. Um, and it's important to know both aspects of that. So that we can make, again, it goes back to choice, uh, make a choice as to now what are we going to do about it, if anything. Looking at yourself isn't always easy. Oh, no, no. (laughs) And it's the most important part. um, Because when we are aware of even our thoughts, and I'm working with my clients, and again, I don't care if they're NFL players or C-suite or whoever they are. One of the steps we go through towards the very beginning is writing down what are your thoughts. And I mean exact thoughts. It's something they just, you know, they can put it in their phone. They can, uh, there's a grid that I use. They can use that however they want to write it down. But it's raw, real. If when you think about yourself, it's the, you know, you are the stupidest, you know, expletive, expletive I've ever, you know, see, you're never going to do this. This isn't going to work. I don't know who you think you are. Whatever it is, you write it down. But then on the opposite side, you also write down when you're at your very best, what are the words that you use? What are the feelings that you feel? And label them on both sides, the negative and positive. Um, What are the body sensations that you have? Where in your body are you feeling this? And what behaviors go with it? Sometimes, depending on the person, the behavior could be, you know, I just want to go in a corner and get in a fetal position and hide my head or put a fist through a wall or go play a video game so I can try to stop the thoughts, which it's a nice, you know, minor mm, uh, way to think that you're stopping the thoughts. All you're doing is trying to drown them out. Um, 
or it could be something that you're just joyous and happy and calm and peaceful or running around like in football slapping butts and, uh, you know, knocking helmets because you're so excited. It's important to know both sides of that equation. What can you do to program joy, that, that wonderful sense of joy and accomplishment into your brain? Well, first you have to figure out what joy means to you. Because what joy means to me might be different than what joy means to you. And to also look at, so what are the things that bring you joy? It goes back to, you know, what are the thoughts you have? Where do you feel it in your body? Is there a color or sensation that goes with it? What type of things might you do when you are feeling joyful? Um, I do um, with my clients something that I call imagination. It's just capital E hyphen imagination. Um, And it's deep visualization that allows them to go to a place where they lose track of time and space in order to reprogram their brain, actually take the synapses and pull apart the old pattern and start to uh, build, consciously build a new pattern that they choose, their words, their pictures, their feelings, um, in order to build that new framework. Um, And to also notice when you're feeling happy and again, praise yourself for the thoughts that you're having, the things that you're doing that are uh, bringing you that sense of joy. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. You can subscribe to our free podcast at www.bumpintheroad.us or become a premium member to hear the full conversation. Just go to www.bumpintheroad.us for more information and to sign up.